before we get into thinking about what employee ownership ecosystems are, what the roles of anchor institutions and anchor collaboratives might be, we really need to be grounded in a firm understanding and common vocabulary about what we're talking about with employee ownership. And so um, this opened up the opportunity and, and Marjorie was available, thankfully, um, to give us an introduction to employee ownership and talk about its implications and why, why it's important now in particular. Yeah, as Nate said, I'm uh, Executive Vice President at the Democracy Collaborative and I have been working intensively in employee ownership for three years. And um, so I just wanted to give an overview and Nate will, can share this PowerPoint with you and please feel free to use some of these slides uh, with your own community as you're trying to educate others. Um, so, I wanted to just start with, you know, why, why now? Why is, is this an important time for employee ownership? And there, there's what's being called the silver tsunami. And this is um, baby boomers are retiring. They have 2.3 million businesses. They're going to sell or liquidate those businesses in the next, in the next uh, two decades, some say even in 10 years. And very few of these have exit strategies. And so uh, if judging by the past, nine out of 10 will close. And so there's a chance to keep these locally owned through transitioning to employee ownership. On some of the slides here from Project Equity, good friends of ours in the Bay Area who do consulting around the country, they've come up with these numbers and they're saying baby boomers own half of private, privately held businesses. And um, they're in all kinds of, of industries. I'll add that uh, Project Equity is really good at doing inventories of local businesses, how many are at risk of closure. They've done this for a series of businesses. So that's a, a series of cities. That's a useful tool to be aware of. Um, so half, half of the jobs come from small local businesses. Local businesses circulate three times more money back into the local economy. So you have much more benefit for the whole community when businesses are locally owned. And so employee ownership is a key way to keep businesses locally owned. Um, and so it's, it's a critical tool for keeping our, our local small business economies going. And um, so that's one point. And that is another is that asset ownership goes along with good jobs as a key solution to inequality. The, this amazing statistic, 47% of Americans can't put together even $400 in an emergency. So we, uh, as a society, we tend to focus a lot on jobs. Jobs are, are going away. Uh, a lot of them are being automated out of existence. And meanwhile, people don't have assets. Um, and asset ownership is, is critical to having um, well-being and some stability in your family. A third point of why now for employee ownership is that it's, it's on the policy table as never before. Um, there are, there's a whole group that's working for state centers for employee ownership. A couple just recently own, opened in North Carolina and Massachusetts. I'm told there's another half dozen in the pipeline. Uh, the employee Ownership Expansion Network is working on that. A number of cities are also promoting employee ownership, and here's just a few of them. So if the time is right for this. Now, so I want to give just an introduction to different kinds of employee ownership. Um, the one that m might be the best known is the worker-owned co-op, which is one worker, one vote, and workers elect the board. Employees buy a share of their business, uh, often at an affordable price, and workers own 100% of the business. Financing can be difficult for this model because uh, generally lenders want a personal guarantee, and it's not clear in a cooperative who that will come from. Employee stock ownership plan is another form of employee ownership. It's a, it exists today at a much larger scale in the US. There are um, uh, maybe 10 times as many employee stock ownership plans. This is only a second generation strategy. You never start a company as an ESOP, you transition into an ESOP. It's a, it's a trust, it's a tax qualified retirement plan for employees. Employees do not pay for their shares. They receive their ownership as a retirement benefit and the company borrows money in order to basically buy itself from its founder and, and then transition to employee ownership. You can have a variety of, as worker co-ops or 100% of the business uh, by definition, you can have a, a small amount of, of equity in an employee you know, ESOP company or you can go to 100%. 
And uh, tax incentives are more generous for ESOPs. Uh, in fact, um, if you're an S corp, which means your profits pass through to to the owners, uh, and you're 100% employee owned through an ESOP, the company will pay zero taxes, zero income taxes at the enterprise level. So there are some tax advantages that are not fully available to worker co-ops. Uh, again, you know, feel free to use these slides and refer to them later. Worker co-ops uh, tend to be smaller. I said up to 100 million in size. That's maybe a little arbitrary, but you can have even a small company of five or six workers. ESOPs tend to be, you want to have a, a 20 employees, maybe $2 million of revenue. And then you can have a democratic ESOP. An ESOP is, is kind of a, an empty frame and you can put more uh, worker involvement in there. You can put more, you can put worker votes in there. You, you, can, you can go above the, the minimum. And that's what we call a democratic ESOP. Um, there are more tax benefits for ESOPs. And if you if you, if there's interest in that, we could get um, we could get you some information on that. Um, there's there's for example there's a, a 403 rollover for uh, owners who sell to an employee to at least to an ESOP, and I'm not sure about worker co-ops. It might be true for worker co-ops too. They can roll over their capital gains if they as long as they put it into another U.S. stock, then they they can defer capital gains from almost indefinitely. An ESOP does require an annual valuation. It's, it's governed by ERISA, which is the Retirement um, Security uh, Infrastructure. It's also regulated by the Department of Labor. So you do need to have an annual valuation and um, there are some administrative fees for an ESOP. So that's one reason why uh, you, you wanna have a, a slightly larger company. Uh, as I said, worker co-ops do People do buy in, they have to buy their shares in ESOPs, you don't. Um, and the other, the other pieces are, uh, are flexible. So just by the numbers, there are, um, there are about 7,000 companies that have ESOPs. Here I'm listing only the 2,000 that have 30% or more employee ownership, because that's when you start to have a genuine employee uh, engagement culture becomes possible. Uh, by contrast, there are about 450 worker co-ops. The largest that I'm aware of as an ESOP is Recology. It's 1.2 billion in revenue, has 3,600 workers. The largest worker co-op by, by headcount is Cooperative Home Care Associates in the Bronx. It's 65 million in revenue and 2,300 workers. So the scale in terms of revenue is substantially different. And, and this CHDA is, is a large worker co-op. So by and large, these are smaller companies. Um, Worker-owned co-ops, their aggregate revenue is 450 million. Uh, so that's all worker co-ops in the U.S. added together. Their, their revenue is about a, less than a half a billion. And um, whereas Recology, for example, is one firm, it has revenue of uh, more than double that, almost triple that. And other, other, there are other ESOP companies that easily have 400 million in revenue and up. So these are much larger companies and there's many more of them. The 1.3 trillion in assets is, is uh, all, all ESOP assets added together. There are some challenges with employee ownership. Um, the companies are, uh, with an ESOP, you know, the company's buying itself. That was, that was the intention of um, Kelso when he set this up. It's, it's the way private equity works. You use the company's own strength to, to pay back loans, but that can be a bit of a strain on cash flow. ESOPs do have a government oversight. Um, banks, as I mentioned, are sometimes reluctant to lend to worker co-ops. They want that personal guarantee. Um, you do, in order to unlock the benefits of employee ownership, you want an ownership culture, you want participatory management and, and good governance. And employee training is usually critical to helping people think like owners. Being an employee owned is not the same as having collective management. Um, this is a common error. There's a difference between government governance and management. And also you still need competent managers. Uh, none of us uh, vote on which streets are paved in our cities. So um, having employee ownership doesn't mean that, um, that management goes away. It, it, uh, benefits for the owners, it creates liquidity. They get to um, they get to realize the value they have built. This is critical, I think, for your local communities to help to understand. You have these local owners who built something and they need to realize the value of that. It also preserves their legacy. 
as opposed to seeing this company get shut down or acquired. As I mentioned, there's tax incentives. There is research that shows there's higher productivity. There's one fourth the likelihood of layoffs. There's um, slightly higher profits, slightly higher wages for, for these employee owned companies. And um, so it's, it's uh, financially really quite rewarding for exiting, exiting owners. Uh, some cooperatives that we at Democracy Collaborative helped to design and begin are the Evergreen Co-ops in Cleveland. We worked with the Cleveland Foundation. They were the anchor institution for this work. Uh, they're one of them. And then uh, we also worked with um, other local anchors, which I'll talk about in a moment. But these were deliberately created to hire the disadvantaged and to do green development and to model the role of anchor institutions. So there's, uh, you see here these, um, a big uh, uh, greenhouse growing herbs and lettuce for local consumption. There's a cooperative laundry and energy solutions. Um, about 40% of the workers are formally incarcerated and uh, they can get a nice uh, chunk of profit sharing in recent years. About 240 workers. There, there's a whole ecosystem here. And we'll, Nate and I said we'll talk later about ecosystems to support employee ownership. That'll be a separate session. But here, I just wanted to show this one. Um, the anchor institutions that, that, that created large contracts to help with the startup and continuation of these employee owned companies include Cleveland Clinic, Case Western Reserve University, University Hospitals. The city of Cleveland came in and helped get some, um, uh, some uh, loans together, Ohio Employee Ownership Center, an independent nonprofit did some technical assistance and the Cleveland Foundation funded a lot of this. That's an example of, um, of an ecosystem that is, is supporting these worker-owned co-ops, these co-ops, and they're networked together also by a common holding company, which means they're not going to be sold out um, away from the community and they have support, which helps them uh, stay alive over time. So here again is a slide you can use with um, your local communities. It creates an economy with more equitable outcomes. You know, you're using the basic structure of firms to create equitable outcomes. Uh, so you're, that this is a very stable form of, of, uh, of uh, a, a way to address inequality. And I think it's, um, it's, it's also self-sustaining. You don't need ongoing philanthropy or, or government benefits. These, these companies become self-sustaining over time. There's some interesting research from National Center for Employee Ownership that these uh, young people, 28 to 34, at employee-owned companies, they have almost double the household net worth, 33% higher wages, and, and much greater job stability than at traditional firms. So there's benefits for communities and for workers. Now, um, it's really important to understand, we talked about two different models of employee ownership, ESOPs and worker co-ops. There are also different two, two different routes to employee ownership. And one is to do a startup, and the other is to do a conversion. Um, so startups, the Evergreen co-ops, were startups. You can, you can use this model um, to target the disadvantaged or people of color or the formerly incarcerated. That often will work better with the startup. You can select your industry. There is a higher risk of failure. We know that startups often fail. Uh, it's a slow and difficult um, path. Starting a company is, is very fraught. Um, and worker co-ops uh, work in this model. ESOPs are only used for conversions. So um, a, an example of conversion that we were involved in is we've helped create the Fund for Employee Ownership at Evergreen, which is right now, it's raised about 13 million. It's gonna go out and acquire businesses in Northeast Ohio and then convert them to employee ownership and they'll exit into the, into the Evergreen network. So this is a, an active a conversion strategy using capital um, as, an, as an agent. So you approach existing businesses, you say, do you wanna sell your business? Rather than telling them, you need to master all the complexities of employee ownership, you just basically sell, say, do you wanna sell? And we'll, we'll handle the complexity. That's the, that's the fund approach. Um, uh, and then this, it can be either ESOP or a worker co-op. We're agnostic on that. Financing is easier when you have an existing company. It's very hard to finance a startup. It's very hard to get equity and you can't get loans. Uh, whereas an existing company with proven cash flow, proven business model, it's much easier to get, to get financing. Uh, it's, a, it's a faster 
way to get to scale. So this is going to be a key uh, distinction for you to understand. I, and now I have a few examples of worker co-ops and, and, and ESOP companies. Um, in Silicon Valley, this is a worker co-op with 33 employees uh, working with Project Equity to become worker owners. Um, here is a very small company. I believe this is in the entire company <laughs> in, in Western Mass. It's called Real Pickles. This was a small local food business. The, the, the founders wanted to get out. They were older. So what they did is they did an innovative financing. They did a direct public offering. So they went out to the community and they raised a half million dollars from 77 investors in two months. And they used that to help the workers buy the firm. So this was a, a case when the workers did not have to, I mean, the workers will have to pay for their shares, but the money to, to borrow the company came from um, uh, uh, this direct public offering. Uh, and again, that's something we could bring in an expert to talk about if, if that's of interest. This is, I mentioned, the largest worker cooperative by headcount, Cooperative Home Care Associates. These are uh, mostly African-American and Latina women. They work in uh, going into the homes of the elderly and disabled and helping them with home care, um, home health care issues. 2,300 employees. It's been around 33 years. It's been profitable uh, 30 of those years. It's going through a difficult time right now. They've had to raise their wage from 11 to 15 because of New York minimum wage law. And uh, they're finding some of their um, uh, suppliers are not com completely compliant. But um, they're doing well. And um, it's, there's actually a movement to create more of these. So there's 15 worker-owned home health care cooperatives, either in development or in existence. So there's a whole community of people who are working on this particular model and scaling it. So you'll notice. Already, we're hearing a little bit about ecosystem here. There's a fund approach using capital to scale. There's a particular model which you can replicate and scale. Um, those are different ways to approach uh, increasing employee ownership. This company, in this and this particular, I think, industry, they see that delivering quality care by creating quality jobs actually creates superior care for um, for the clients. And, and it creates a superior jobs for employees. So it's a wonderful niche where um, this employee ownership is actually uh, a demonstrably superior model. Also, it's not a high profit industry, so there's not a lot of not a lot of private equity wanting to get into the home care, home health care business. This is a company I always like to mention because people, and, you, and I urge you to consider mentioning this to your communities. People often think employee ownership means small marginal companies. Um, Recology has been around 100 years. It's 100% employee owned. Um, it was founded by uh, Italian immigrants doing work no one wanted to do, which is picking up trash. It's 100% employee owned. I might have said that. 3,600 employee owners. And it's a place where garbage collectors make $100,000 a year. Because uh, when, you don't, when you're not extracting a lot of profit for external absentee shareholders, there's more money to go around. This is for workers. And this is also a company that's highly dedicated to um, creating a better environment. They have a, a vision of a world without waste. Um, very, very inspiring company. Here's another one that a project equity is involved in. There are, uh, this is a, a craft beer is another sector in which uh, 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 there are a number of companies going to employee ownership. Here's one of them. Um, they purchased, the ESOP purchased 30% of company stock. So again, you don't need 100% employee ownership. You can do um, a smaller amount. And they're using um, uh, open book management and different uh, activities to create an ownership culture among employees. One of the best known employee owned companies is New Belgium Brewing. It's 100% employee owned. Um, 250 million revenue. I like to mention this is another company with a strong ecological orientation. They built a new plant on a brownfield recently in North Carolina and they remediated it and they did that deliberately. So it's um, it's really designed to benefit both workers and the community and the environment. So here's the founder of Kim Jordan and I think this is a lovely statement. Um, you know she said we looked at everything. How, how is she going to exit? She doesn't want to own this company forever. No, no founder lives forever. She said, in the end, we knew it was the ESOP that was going to be best because those are the people, these are the people who understand the culture and can maintain its core values and take it into the future. This is a really important selling point for founders. 
uh, to understand. And I think hearing it from other founders is, uh, is always very important. Here's another founder who, who said very much the same thing, Eileen Fisher. Again, this is a $440 million company. Um, it's a B Corp. A lot of the companies I'm mentioning here are B Corps, um, which means it's a benefit company. It, they have in their charter that they exist for public benefit, not just for profit maximization. So they have both employee ownership and uh, B Corp status. That makes them uh, what I call a next generation enterprise, really a model for what all companies ought to look like in the future. And here again, Eileen looked at selling to a competitor and she said, I didn't want an empty shell in this company. I wanted the people who put their blood and sweat and tears into it to be the owners. So this is how founders are often thinking when they're going to employee ownership. Just very quickly, I'll tell this story. AA Engineering um, is an environmental consulting firm that for a while went public, which means your shares trade on public stock markets. They traded on NASDAQ. Uh, it nearly destroyed the firm. Uh, it, the, instead of being, instead of being, their mission is to improve the quality of the environment one project at a time. But as a publicly traded company, they found that their mission was to maximize profits and share price over, over the, the quarter. And that virtually destroyed the culture of the firm. Morale dropped. They cycled through three presidents um, and they got in trouble with the SEC over earnings misstatements. So the founder stepped in, bought it back, transferred it to 100% employee ownership and it became a benefit corporation. Benefit corporation is similar to B Corp. It's a framework in state law that you can incorporate um, as a for-benefit company. So this is a cautionary tale, I think, for founders. Um, the, the choice is not just should you do employee ownership, but if you sell to capital, um, you can often see what you have built uh, be destroyed. Another large company, this is in, in the UK, the United Kingdom, uh, 13 billion in revenue, 85,000 uh, partners. It's the largest department store chain in the UK. Uh, and it governs itself by a, a, a constitution. Its purpose is to serve employee happiness um, through uh, successful business. This company has been so successful, it's created an entire movement in the UK for employee ownership because it is outperforming its peers. Um, it's showing that when you have employees who are long-term, who share in the wealth, um, they're gonna be, they're gonna be uh, help run a better, a better company. One of the challenges of employee ownership, it is often unknown. And here we see Andrew Del Monte. He's a business advisor at the Small Business Development Center at SUNY Buffalo. And he says, you know, it's very rarely presented to owners as an option. So they tend to think of it as a fringe idea. And he said, much of my work is spent dispelling the myth that employee ownership is a strange, risky, or impossible idea. So uh, again, hopefully some of the, the materials here can help you with this. This is from uh, Democracy at Work Institute, and these are the stages of employee ownership conversion. And you explore the idea, uh, and then once you uh, get into the actual, there's interest from the founder, you assess, you structure, you complete the deal, and that's nine to 18 months, and then support the company um, over time. So these are not, these are not quick, these, um, uh, these don't happen quickly. This is a conversion that they're talking about here. Now, when you use capital, it, it's a little bit quicker. You just buy the company and then, and then you handle this stuff through, the, through a fund. Um, the sale of, of, of companies through conversions to employee ownership are leveraged, which means there are loans involved. Uh, so you, you have um, the business owner will be paid off. You the employee owned business will borrow from a bank and pay off the founder. Often the uh, founder is also asked to keep some skin in the game and put in, you know, maybe 20% of the value and, keep, and stay on the hook for, for um, a, a number of years is often how it's done. Um, I want to emphasize here that none of you need to be experts in employee ownership. I know some of you are already, um, but if you're not, like the Tucson Cooperative Network, I'm sure um, you know all about employee ownership. Those of you who don't, you don't, you don't have to be a specialist. There are all, all kinds of support out there, and we can help connect you to these, to these people, um, accountants, bankers, lenders, you know, insurance lawyers, and then developers. There's usually there's usually a developer who develops an employee-owned business or 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 handles a conversion. Um, People specialize either in worker co-ops or ESOPs or sometimes 
sometimes both. Here are, uh, Nick has shared a little bit with you some uh, beginning materials. Here's some more. So you'll, he'll share this with you. You can click on these things and get some of these resources. Here's more resources and um, some pieces of reading. Becoming Employee Owned Toolkit. I think we shared that with you. That's a very good basic primer getting started. Here's an article on um, business succession from the National Center for Employee Ownership. Um, and then employee ownership, that, this, this bottom one is kind of a big statement about why it builds a better economy. So these might be of use to you in your work. Um, I, I and my uh, colleague, Ted Howard, have a new book out. It just came out this summer, The Making of Democratic Economy. And employee ownership is one of the topics we cover a lot. We also have a whole chapter on anchors. But these are some of the companies that we talk about in the book. So if you're interested in reading more, you'll find uh, chapters on all of these in, in the book. So there we go. Um, I'd love to hear some questions and comments and some dialogue. All right, great. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, that, was, that was fantastic. Um, I know we have at least one question uh, from Ray that, that they shared in the chat. Uh, but just to just to kick it off um, and to start zooming out a little bit to to the ecosystem, um, I'm interested in hearing kind of what percent of the uh, employee ownership support system is focusing on conversion versus startup, um, and are there particular support needs for converting to employee ownership? Um. What I am seeing, and I'd be interested to hear about from some of your uh, members too, Nate, here, and that is um, I am hearing more and more focus on conversions um, because it's faster to scale, it's less risky, it's easier to finance. Um, so I, I know a number of developers are, are leaning toward conversions. That being said, at the city level, there is some focus on uh, startups. New York City has funded worker cooperative organizations, and I know there's startups there. There are there are almost kind of two communities here. One one community is a worker co-op community that want to uh, use worker co-ops to assist people of color, the disadvantaged. Often those will involve startups, um, and then ESOPs tend to be more about scaling employee ownership. They're about broad benefit um, for lots of employees. Um, so they're, they're kind of two separate communities. Uh, you can use the tools uh, interchangeably, and I, and I think it's important to see it all as one community, but there tend to be different foci within these groups. OK, thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, Let's, uh, let's open it up for questions. I'll, I'm going to go to Ray first. Um, there was a question that you shared in, in the chat during the presentation, just to, to clarify a point. Um, would you like to bring that up again, Ray? I um, heard that you were saying, Marjorie, that businesses that convert, that they sell to their employees, don't pay capital gains tax. Just wondering if I could clarify that. Yeah. Um, so it's the founder, so the individual or the found family that is selling to employee mm -hmm. ownership. Mm -hmm. um, normally, you know, that's an asset, you pay capital gains on it. But there is what's called the 403B rollover. And what that says is that um, if you roll over the income from the sale of this, this asset um, to employees, you can roll over that money into, let's say, stock in IBM or stock in, you know, some other U.S. company. Then you don't have to pay uh, taxes, capital gains taxes, on that right away. You can defer it. Now, how long you can defer it, I don't really know. Is it, is it for the rest of your life? Um, but we we could get an expert in here, I think, to to help answer that question. But yes, that's the there's a rollover of capital gains. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think I did see something in one of the readings about that rollover being indefinite. Is it? I, it's, I don't want to be on record for that, but I, I seem to remember that in a reading. And that, that can be a pretty substantial uh, benefit to a, to a seller. Yeah, absolutely. What other questions does the group have? 
Marjorie, this is Jessica from Denver. Have you seen any, what has been the impact of the Main Street Employee Ownership Act? Um, yeah. yeah. Thoughts on that? Here in Colorado, I think we're finally making progress, but it took a while for even the um, small business development centers to even embrace the concept of employee ownership. Yeah. Yes. Um, the the small business, or no, it's the Main Street Employee Ownership Act was passed in August. Odd, oddly enough, it got uh, attached to a defense appropriation bill and got passed that way, but it did have um, bipartisan support. Kirsten uh, uh, Gillibrand, the senator from New York, was the main spearhead, and we worked with her office on this, as did a lot of employee ownership um, experts. And uh, so what it does is it, it mandates that the Small Business Administration incorporate employee ownership into its toolkit. So you have around the country about um, 900 small business development centers. About half of them are at universities and colleges, um, and half of them are, are I don't know, freestanding. But they, they tend to be funded half by the state and half by the university if they're if they're at a university. So we ran a working group for about a year um, here at the Democracy Collaborative with universities that have SBDCs and wanted to begin incorporating employee ownership. And, and in fact, a number of the slides I'm using here are from a training session that we did, this training session uh, that our people of our working group did, we did trainings at um, a, a group of different SBDCs. Because the challenge that we're told is that SBDC directors, they didn't, they didn't get an allocation of funding with this bill, they got a mandate, but how are they gonna fund it? And so we were helping to provide training. So their challenge is, they might have 30 advisors that work with them, but those advisors are not comfortable enough with employee ownership in order to help business owners uh, learn about it. So we were helping to, to sponsor some trainings of, of these advisors. So that, that um, went pretty well. Um, there are a number of places that are working on this. I know that there's an, um, an SBA office in DC. It's the, it's the, um, the regional office, not the not the national office, has done some trainings on small business uh, uh, on um, on employee ownership. So we we have a, we did a blog on that. I think we've done one or two blogs on this. It seems it's a little bit slow. That I know um, Project Equity. Um, no, I'm sorry, not Project Equity. Democracy at Work Institute is working on this, um, trying to uh, get the word out to uh, the SBDCs. But nothing has come from the SBA yet. They've been very slow in implementing this new mandate. Now they're supposed to create toolkits and a new center for employee ownership. None of that has actually come to pass yet. So people are working on it kind of on their own, on the ground, I think in the absence of the, this slow, uh, in the presence of this slow federal action. But I'm, what, what I'm hopeful, and I think all of us are, is that this is a major highway for information on employee ownership that will be opening up. Uh, I, I think it could, its impact could be substantial. Great, thanks for that, Marjorie. Yeah. Who's next? Hi, can you hear me? This is yep, Wayne. go ahead, Wayne. All right, great. Um, sorry, I apologize if you've already gone over this. I kind of came in in the middle. I'm curious about the um, the piece on the leveraged conversion, and I'm wondering about um, the financing of that. Is in those models um, is is there a need to develop um, specialized financing tools, um, or is it the experience that sort of traditional lending um, sources um, uh, sort of are suitable for these conversions and ensuring that the sort of the terms ensure uh, long-term sustainability and don't hamstring the, the new co-op. Yeah. Um, again, we've done a couple of blogs on this. So, um, so Nick, maybe you could go look for some, or some, any of you, we have the 50 by 50 site. So I think it's spelled out 50 by 50.org. And um, if you go to employee ownership news, uh, we, we've had a few blogs on financing. My understanding is that if you're doing an ESOP conversion, uh, traditional bank lending is generally available. They'll often want that 20% uh, 
exiting owner um, skin in the game. So, but they'll, but you can usually find financing for the rest of it. Uh, that's my understanding. Now, worker co-ops do have some difficulty with financing. This is one of the things that this new SBA mandate was supposed to take care of, but the SBA uh, was not able to come up with an alternative to the personal guarantee. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, so th I think that's still being worked on. And so how do you finance a conversion to worker ownership? I did talk about the direct public offering, which is going out to sort of your stakeholder base. Um, there are groups, uh, um, there are CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, CDFIs, which are local loan funds uh, that often are friendly to worker co-ops. And there's one in the um, uh, New England, uh, does anybody remember the name of that? It's New England Cooperative Development Fund. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, I think the Cooperative Fund of New England. Yeah, co thank you. Cooperative Fund of New England. They, they focus specifically on cooperatives. And there's also the National Cooperative Bank uh, does cooperative lending. Uh, now, again, you have to have a viable business. You have to show that this business is can pay back the loan. I mean, these are not, these are not grants. Um, so you need to have a, a viable business capable of carrying the debt. Um, but yes, lending for cooperative conversions is, it takes a little bit of ingenuity is, is my understanding. It's, it's being done, uh, but it's not, it's not quite as simple as going to the bank often. Marjorie, you probably aren't aware of this, but Wayne's calling from Toronto, Canada. Is, are, you, are you aware of anything in, uh, in Canada that's particular in terms of employee ownership or, or about this question? Well, what I would say, yeah, in Canada, there's a large movement called um, I, the solidarity economy, or maybe it's the social economy, they might call it. Um, uh, Quebec in, in particular has uh, a large social economy sector. So there is some government support. I, I, I believe that the social economy in Canada is defined to include both uh, worker-owned businesses and social enterprises and social enterprises are businesses that have a strong social mission. They can often be owned by nonprofits or um, operate sometimes with subsidy. They might, they might be 80% self-sufficient and need a 20% subsidy. Um, Goodwill Industries is an example of a, of, a, of a social enterprise. So those are, that's another business model that's part of the social economy. But yeah, I think Canada is pretty, pretty active in this space. Great. What other questions do we have? Marjorie, I'm curious if you could just talk a little bit more about the distinction between employee ownership and B Corps and benefit corporations and kind of the mm -hmm. overlap um, mm -hmm. among them and, and sure. what you're doing there. Yeah, we've done a fair amount of research on this and have a new report out, if anyone is interested. It's called Best of the Best, um, the mission-driven employee-owned firm. Um, and what I, what I would say is that um, at, the, at the Democracy Collaborative, I mean, what we're, what we're about is trying to build a more democratic economy, to benefit everyone and to operate within um, planetary boundaries. I and mean, I think that's the goal of all of us ultimately. And what's the role of business in that? What kind of, I mean, uh, I've been in this space for about 30 years. I used to be the editor uh, and the founder of Business Ethics Magazine. And I, I watched a lot of progressive businesses be sold to multinationals or go public and lose, and lose their social mission. Um, and so I've been um, focused on this for many, many years. And what, and what I've seen is that um, if you have a mission-driven business, um, and it usually is the founder or the CEO who really has a, a social mission with, when they start a business, uh, and you want to preserve that, then selling to employees is a key way to preserve social mission over time because they're steeped in the culture and, uh, and, they, want, and they naturally preserve it. Whereas if you sell to capital, Capital is just looking at, at quarterly earnings. It's just looking at profits, looking at share price, and everything else gets gets jettisoned. I've seen this 
over and over and over and over and over again over the years, and it's not not widely understood. So we did some research on um, what we call the uh, the mission oriented employee owned company, and what we found, you know, if you really want, I think a company that is beneficial to society, beneficial to workers and society, that uh, broad based ownership is critical and is really important. That helps to reduce inequality, but also having a purpose of public benefit. Um, also um, helps. So you're starting to design a company for something besides profit maximization and, and both of those elements. Cooperative Home Care Associates is a B Corp. Um, EA Engineering is a benefit corporation, which is uh, a, a framework in state law. Um, so uh, uh, so what we, we found about 50 of these companies, we convened them in April. And what I like about the idea of these mission-led employee-owned firms is it's also a way to take an ESOP and turn it into something more than just a tax-advantaged exit for a founder, which is sometimes how these are sold. So, so the best ESOPs actually have social mission embedded in them. Um, and uh, so we um, convened these in April, a lot of exciting businesses. And um, so, so we call them next generation enterprise because we think that there's business in general has a lot to learn from these businesses. It's really a superior model for how to do business. And, and we do have that report we can send out to people if you'd be interested in, in learning more. Yeah, I think that intersection is really fascinating and could be an area to explore with this group too, just thinking about the breadth of um, the missions that, that these groups are representing. Yeah, and I have a, a network of about 20 of the CEOs, we had we had 20 CEOs and founders come to our gathering in April of uh, these firms. And they, I think I could help them be available for, for speaking engagements. Sometimes it's, um, it's very powerful for business owners in your community to hear from other business owners and why they, why they sold to employees. So um, let me know if that's of interest. Great, thanks. Can I have a follow up on the sort of um, uh, mission, um, um, your discussion on mission? Um, so, you know, thinking about uh, from an anchor procurement perspective and how we target our procurement, um, I'm wondering about, so, you know, so we're looking at, you know, some of the many things that we're doing here in Toronto, looking at ownership, um, you know, in, uh, in terms of supply chain diversity. And so, yeah. Um, I've been thinking about co-ops and, you know, is it, is it, I should put it more simply, is it more important to focus on form and specifically, you know, um, focusing on ESOPs and, and, and sort of the, sort of the, the guiding uh, governance documents, or is it more important from your perspective to focus on the mission itself um, and be agnostic on the form? Yeah. Um... I think I, I would invite you to, this is something that Nate and I were talking about. Um, what is it that you're trying to do? Are you trying to focus on supplier diversity? So do you want to create more opportunity for people of color and, 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 uh, and women? Um, do you want to, are you wanting to address inequality locally? I mean, what is it that you actually want to do? And I think that, um, I mean, is eco ecology, is ecological impact? part of the mix for, for you, then, um, then uh, I think ownership design and uh, mission orientation are going to be tools that you, that you can use. Uh, for example, I mean, you know, yeah, if you're looking, if you're looking at uh, as, a, as a, an anchor at companies that you want to support, maybe you want to keep companies locally owned because that benefits the local community. And if it's, if it's inequality that you're concerned about and, and good jobs, good local jobs, then maybe you're gonna look to service industries. Um, and if you help a, a company transition to employee ownership, for example, um, you, 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 could, you could also ask that company to become a B Corp or a benefit corp. So there's a number of ways to, or you could look for local B Corps to support and maybe encourage them to, to uh, transition to employee ownership. So there's a number of different ways, I think, to use these different concepts, depending on your 
on your particular circumstance and goals. Thank you. More questions? We have we have Marjorie's time for, for 10 or 15 more minutes. So I, I would encourage people to take advantage. Well, you, you were just mentioning, who was it who just asked the anchor question? I didn't catch your name. That was Wayne. That was Wayne. So Wayne, tell me, tell me what you're wanting to do with them. As an um, yeah, I think for, uh, I mean, I guess it depends on which anchor you're talking about, but I think it's for the collaborative um, economic inclusion. Um, so local ownership in some ways. Um, but yeah, like you're talking about sort of inequality is sort of the biggest issue that we're talking about. I'm actually very sort of intrigued by this notion of uh, focusing sectorally as well. For example, like you said, this, uh, focusing specifically on service industry um, uh, businesses as a uh, as a way to strategically focus our efforts, as opposed to just focusing sort of generically on, on co-ops overall. I think that's smart. Yeah, always good to keep in mind, what is it that you're trying to do? Like for example, the, um, because employee ownership is a tool, it's not, it's not the goal, it's a tool. And uh, with the Fund for Employee Ownership in, in Cleveland and in uh, Northeastern Ohio, um, one of our, our investors, and they actually um, is a forgivable loan into the fund if we achieve certain uh, aims. And I think their aim is something like a certain number of, of good jobs per million that they put in. So that that push that pushed the fund towards service companies. They're looking at a, a couple of service companies to acquire because there's a lot more jobs in a service company. So yeah, your sector selector will, selection will depend on what you're trying to do and, and of course you have different tools as an anchor there's purchasing there's also investment um you know could there could they be making loans to businesses or uh, or something so a lot of ways to practice that mm -hmm. maybe as a sort of a false um so you know our anchor and so i'm employed by the the local government of the city so you know not Again, you know, up in here in Canada. Wayne, we're losing you there. Nope. Wayne, would you mind starting over? We lost you there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, someone tried to call me. I don't have my phone. <laughs> um, so I, I'm with the local government. So what would you say, and I'm not familiar really with, uh, with sort of the regulatory and legal environment in the States, but what would you say the ideal role would be for local government or government in general in helping to um, encourage the uh, um, spread of co-ops? Yeah, I think that's that, that's, a, that's a that's a good question. And again, we have a number of articles that we could a number of blogs that we've done on what different cities are doing. Um, I think the ideal role for a city would be to um, do a citywide campaign to look at um, which businesses are at risk of being lost. You know, I mean, we, you know, we lost a lot of our locally owned banks. They got rolled up into the five or six big banks. We lost a lot of our main street companies. I got, they got, you know, put under by malls. You know, it's going to happen again. We're going to lose a lot of local businesses in the next decade if we don't do something to retain them. Um, so uh, it'd, be, it'd be good to start with, well, how many, how many are at risk? This is the, the methodology that Project Equity has, has developed. You know, go and you go into the business licenses and you say, how many businesses are over 15 years old? How many have owners who are over 50 years old? Um, do they have five or more employees? You know, so looking at key criteria that would make them good Good candidates for conversions, and then, um, and then uh, reaching out to them and educating them about employee ownership or other kinds of local ownership, um, and and then I think specifically targeting them. That's one way to do it. If you know, if you want to keep businesses locally owned and keep those jobs and 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 keep them uh, create create wealth for employees along the way. Another way to do it would be um, would be to say we want to create good jobs for those who have been excluded 
So then maybe you're then maybe you're starting some companies, and that's a harder way to go. But you can use your anchors there, um, you know, uh, or or even finding some businesses to acquire. For example, um, the Evergreen Co-op. I mentioned that there's a commercial laundry there, but um, what I didn't say is that with the Fund for Employee Ownership, they recently acquired the contract to do all the laundry for Cleveland Clinic, which doubled the number of employee owners overnight. They got 100 new new employee owners on the fast track um, overnight because they got this big contract. They've done such a good job with little contracts from anchors that they are now doing all the laundry for Cleveland Clinic, which is this huge anchor. Um, and and what, what we're seeing is that there are lots of nonprofit hospital systems that are, would be interested in converting their laundry to a worker ownership. So maybe there's a sector, or you know, maybe you can target certain sectors um, for um, using employee ownership as a tool to, to create and retain good jobs. There may not be a one size fits all for all cities. I guess is what I'm saying. That's great, thanks. Great. More questions? I'm interested in uh, circling back on something that we heard from, from Ray at the beginning. Um, when they were describing Tucson and just how there's not much of a support system for employee ownership, mm -hmm. what, what advice, and I, we're going to talk about the ecosystem and support more in our next meeting, like, like you said, but kind of off the cuff, what advice do you have for somebody in, in a community or situation like that? If there's not much of an ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing that I would suggest doing is doing, do an asset inventory. What do you have to work with? Do you have a university that has an SBDC there, a small business development center? Could they be an ally? Um, is there a community college that might do some training on employee ownership? Do you have any employee ownership experts in town? Any ESOP or cooperative development experts? Um, how many employee-owned businesses do you have locally? I mean, what do you what do you have to work with? Because there are different kinds of ecosystems that are created in different cities. You know, in fact, Nate, there was a report that um, I think it was, I think it was Project Equity did on employee ownership ecosystems. And they looked at the kind of different ecosystems in different cities. Oh, Madison, Wisconsin has a high concentration of worker-owned co-ops. And that's one kind of ecosystem because they can help, uh, maybe help start other worker co-ops. Whereas um, uh, others, others, like New York City has, the city is behind worker co-ops and has put a couple of million dollars into that. So they have a bunch, they have some nonprofits that are starting worker co-ops. So you might have different kinds of resources in different, uh, in different cities. We should, we should get that, that ecosystem report out to you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, start with an asset inventory. What do you have to work? What do ecosystems look like in other cities? And what's the, and, and then of course, Anchors, Cleveland has, has its anchor institutions, um, and there there can be used to create a own company. So what, what do you have to work with? And so where, where can you begin to build the ecosystem in your city? Yeah, and that's kind of exactly where we started. We started with a workshop with the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, uh -huh. and one of those was the, we did one focus on immigrants and immigrant-related co-ops, and then did an ecosystem assessment. And in many ways, the resources are low of, you know, the food co-op and the one worker-owned co-op in town both go out of state for all their legal and all their accounting services. Oh, uh, but what we do have is um, community with deep connections and roots to one another. We have strong immigrant-led organizing uh, oh. that has deep roots and relationships um, that have really led to at least being in a position of having folks come together to try to learn these together. So we've just been trying to bring in people from the outside and get on any kind of webinars and trainings that we can um, so that we're learning along the way of how to be co-op developers, really with an emphasis on having people who are first-generation immigrants be trained to be co-op developers within immigrant community here. That's excellent. That seems, that seems like a good universe to work with. because they from what I have been told, many of them come with, with deep skills from their other country um, and could be in a position to be business owners here. That's great. That's good work. 
Jessica, do you have anything to share about working with uh, employee owners who are also part of an immigrant community? I know in our last meeting, you mentioned something about that in Denver. Oh my God, yeah, I was just thinking about all of our efforts and yeah, I think one of the biggest, um, if you had looked at the ecosystem here five years ago, you would have probably thought that it was a pretty strong ecosystem, um, except for the fact that we lacked culturally appropriate product or services. And so we started piloting projects about two years ago in um, community wealth building is uh, looking at learning about the challenges. And so we've developed, uh, we're full, fully developed two worker cooperatives and in the process of developing a third cooperative. Um, and yeah, we've been able to learn a lot. Um, I would say that I, I came with the, 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 the skills needed to be able to do it. Um, even though it technically wasn't my job, I just saw the need. Um, but I would say there's a lot of national resources and there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, yeah. so our family Life has some great resources. Um, I don't know if you all know, but they just published a guide to starting cooperatives and, and it's pretty good. Um, they, they don't have it in Spanish yet, but they're working on that. Um, but yeah, there are so many other resources. And um, Marjorie, I think you're right that every city, and I would say that even every anchor institution has their own needs and uh -huh. a different approach. Um, just like every cooperative and every community requires a different approach. And so I think it just, um, uh, it takes a lot of time to work with anchor institutions, with worker owned cooperatives, or even with groups who are interested in developing cooperatives. But I definitely think that it's worth it. We're now starting to see in Denver much more of a, an interest than we just, uh, our governor has also um, been really invested in the idea. And so if, uh, if I can provide any resources to anyone or share my experiences offline, I would love to do it because we've been, definitely been able to learn a lot. That's great, Jessica. Yeah, so maybe, maybe Nate people could share resources with you and you could distribute them to the group or start a Dropbox or something so that people can um, benefit from, from the resources others know about. Yeah, I'll be happy to organize a hub. Um, Jessica, would, could you repeat the organization that just came out with that toolkit? I, I just missed the name. Center for Family Life in New York. Okay, thank you. All these questions are sending my, my mind into lots of different other question <laughs> areas, and I'm, I'm very curious to hear more from you in the future, Jessica, about the culturally appropriate um, yeah. services that, that you mentioned. I think that's, that's really fascinating and important. Um, any, uh, or do we have one or two more questions before, before I transition to thinking about um, our next meeting? They teach you at facilitator school that you have to be comfortable with silence. <laughs> Okay, so let's transition to, um, so first of all, thank you again, Marjorie. That was uh, fantastic, and, and thank you for answering everyone's questions. Um, so thinking about our, our next meeting, um, in which if, if we're able to have you present, Marjorie, we, we would, uh, more, you would be more than welcome. Um, and the way that we had thought about it was that this, was, this meeting was uh, a, in Employee Ownership 101, kind of an, an introduction. Um, and obviously we've been alluding to and talking about the role of anchors and, and the ecosystem, but, but not really getting into uh, too much detail. And we were thinking about using the next meeting to zoom out a little bit. Um, and so I wanted to get the group's reaction to that idea. Um, and then any questions that you would like us to address in, in that meeting um, to give us some time to, to be prepared and, and make sure we're targeting what you're interested in. See, when you say zoom out, what do you mean? Yeah, I was actually just thinking I might need to clarify that. So uh, if, we're, if we're talking about um, zooming out from the employee-owned businesses themselves and how they come about to the, the ecosystem that supports them and the anchor institutions and anchor collaboratives that are supporting their, their formation and, and uh, continued business, um, that's what I mean by zooming out. So kind of out, out, more to the strategic level, Wayne, is what I was thinking. Yeah. No, no, no that, that makes sense. I, I appreciate that. I like that idea. Okay. 
So any questions that, that people have after letting these ideas percolate a little bit for the, the past 30 minutes, um, what would you be interested in in terms of anchors, anchor collaboratives, and ecosystem support uh, for our next meeting? Um, I think it would be good to review the uh, an ecosystem approach. Uh, Marjorie went over a slide really quick, but in looking at the role that anchor institutions play, that governments play, that um, small businesses can play, in looking at the whole in organizations, nonprofits, foundations, and really digging into what it takes because. One of the things that that are, that we've learned is that it really takes a whole village to raise a corporate or an employee-owned business. And so, looking at strategically how we start to align those efforts or how we deepen the connections and relationships to make sure that we're creating something strong. Great, mm -hmm. I love that question. And um, Jessica also just shared the link to that guide in the chat for everyone. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and it's actually a link to a, a, the form that where they're tracking um, okay. of who gets the link or who gets who's using the resource. Um, and so once you complete this form, they they'll send you a link to it. Okay, great. What other questions? I think for me, um, you know, we're kind of, I feel like we're starting from scratch. So just, you know, understanding what are the stages and as we build out the ecosystem and we have the ideal ecosystem, but sort of what are ideal sort of stages in that journey? So, you know, what, sh what should we be aiming for in year, you know, in the first, in the short term, medium term, long term? Really interesting question. And, and, and possibly the kind of thing that we'll develop as a group. Um, I think okay. you, working, working together as a, a group of different case studies, um, it'll be interesting to, to see what those stages are. But I, I, I know Marjorie has several case studies to share of other cities and, and communities ecosystems. Um, so we can maybe compare the stages from those. Any last questions? Yes, I would also be interested in looking at policy changes that have happened that have supported or not um, cooperatives and employee ownership. Um, I think the more that we start to think about systems level approach, mm -hmm. the more that we'll be able to see impact, long lasting impact. Yeah, what are, what are the upstream effects mm -hmm. in, the, in the ecosystem? Great. Um, Marjorie, any, any last comments from you before before we close? Yeah, I, I guess I'll just say it, it sounds like there's an exciting group here. And, um, I, you know, I'm happy to, to uh, pull together some external examples and share some materials. But I hope that very quickly we'll also be hearing from each other because I think there's a lot of wisdom in the room here. And um, I hope we can learn from each other soon. Marjorie, thank you again for, for your time and expertise. Um, and everyone, thank you for, for joining us and for your uh, thoughtful questions and, and participation. This was a, a really great session.